Managing hyponatremia, a common important scenario encountered in clinical practice. How do we define hyponatremia? Well, normal levels are between 135 to 145 millimoles per litre, and therefore hyponatremia is anything below 135 millimoles per litre. We can categorize the severity of hyponatremia with mild, moderate, and severe. Hyponatremia is also classified with fluid status. Why is this? Because it influences management. Hypovolemic hyponatremia has decreased total body water and further decreases in total body sodium. Uvolemic hyponatremia is normal body sodium with an increase in total body water and hypovolemia sees a greater increase in total body water. Again, the importance of these classifications is because it influences management. The classification goes further to include osmolality. Hyponatremia can be hypo, iso or hypertonic depending on serum osmolality. The number of dissolved particles in the serum consisting mainly of sodium chloride bicarbonate, glucose and urea. Normal serum osmolality is 280 to 290. Again, why is this classification important? Because it alludes to the cause of hyponatremia. Hypertonic hyponatremia in a patient may be the result of hyperglycemia, as glucose has profound effects on plasma osmolality. Other causes include mannitol, maltose, or sucrose in IVIG administration. These substances draw water out of cells, lowering sodium in the serum. Hypotonic hyponatremia is caused by SIADH. SIADH. ADH causes increased reabsorption of solute free water. Ordinarily, ADH is released by the posterior pituitary in response to hypertonicity. This results in increased reabsorption of solute-free water in the nephron via the addition of aquaporin channels amongst other mechanisms, causing the hypertonicity of the blood to return to isotonicity. With undue ADH secretion, as in SIADH, sol solute-free water is absorbed further, causing hypertonicity to be achieved. Pseudohyponatremia is hyponatremia with normal serum osmolality and can be seen in severe hyperlipidemia or hyperproteinemia. The protein or lipids displace the liquid. In translocational hyponatremia, this is seen in severe hyperglycemia or mannitol or glycerol administration where these substances cause water to move out of cells into the ECF, resulting in hyponatremia via dilution, bringing it all together. SIADH would be classified as hypotonic hyponatremia seen in a uvolemic state. Okay, so now we are moving on to the symptoms of hyponatremia, and these can be split into mild, moderate, and severe. Mild symptoms include nausea, vomiting, headache, anorexia, lethargy. Mod moderate symptoms include cramps, confusion, ataxia, and severe symptoms include drowsiness, seizures, and coma. An important point to note is that the severity of symptoms do not necessarily correlate with the severity of hyponatremia. The time taken to develop hyponatremia is key. Why is this? With a gradual development of hyponatremia, changes in concentrations and therefore osmosis takes place gradually, resulting in a smaller gradient between intracellular solute and extracellular solute concentration. Therefore, the patient has little symptoms. However, if this gradient is suddenly increased, for example, in marathon runners who drink pure hypertonic water, acute psychogenic polydipsia, ecstasy use, you develop acute hyponatremia. Now, acute hyponatremia is a issue. The intracellular fluid is now relatively hypertonic in comparison to the serum. This causes fluid to shift from the extracellular to intracellular space, which may result in cere cerebral edema, brainstem herniation, and death if left untreated. Timely intervention at this stage can prevent this, as intracellular solute has not equalized. This means with acute hyponatremia, we can tackle it aggressively. It is important to rapidly correct these patients, even if they present with a mild, if, even if they present with mild symptoms such as forgetfulness. We use hypertonic saline. The difficulty therefore lies in correcting chronic hyponatremia. Intracellular solute has equalized with extracellular solute. Therefore, aggressive correction is not an option, as it will result in demyelination syndrome. In regards to correcting chronic hyponatremia, the Endocrinology Society guidelines state that this should be no more than 8 millimoles in a 24-hour period. Preferably, this should be done in a level 2 facility. 
Signs of hypernatremia include confusion, this is important, loss of consciousness, cognitive impairment, seizures, and brainstem herniation in severe cases. So we encounter a patient who is severely hypernatremic as seen in these values. How do we address this? After carrying out the ABCD ease of initial assessment looking for symptoms and signs of hypernatremia, we would assess the volume status to determine management. Volume status can be hypervolemic, uvolemic, and hypovolemic. How do we determine the volume status in a clinical situation? We look at the vital signs and the physical examination as well as laboratory parameters but the history and physical examination are key for determining, determining the volume status of a patient. Okay, so now we have information on both the sodium and the volume status of the patient so we can discuss management options. There are several causes of hypervolemia with hypernatremia. They include con congestive heart failure, liver cirrhosis, pregnancy, and kidney disease, aka CKD, nephrotic syndrome. Management of hypervolemic patients with the hypernatremia is to fluid restrict to prevent fluid overload. What does it mean to fluid restrict? Well, reduce fluid intake to 500 milliliters to 750 milliliters and take account of water content of meals, teas, coffees. Fluid loss is also monitored by weight checks and urinary catheters. Causes of hypovolemia with hypernatremia include blood loss, dehydration, diuretic use. GI losses such as vomiting and diarrhea can also cause this as can third space losses such as burns, pancreatitis and peritonitis. Aldosterone deficiency, osmo osmotic diuresis with glucose, mantle, urea and salt losing nephropathies can also cause this. Managing patients with hypervolemia and hyponatremia would be to infuse with 0.9% saline, restoring extracellular fluid. What about a uvolemic patient who presents with hyponatremia? We have to consider SIADH diuretics, notably Pfizer diuretics, and uh, to a lesser degree, loop diuretics can cause this. It is also important to check the drug list of any patient who reads as hyponatremic as drugs commonly cause the condition. Addison's disease. Here we would look for hyponatremia, hyperkalemia and a acidotic patient. Hypothyroidism, increased fluid intake can also cause this as and factors such as emotional stress, nausea, pain and post-operative states lead to a non-osmotic release of ADH and should be considered. More on syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone secretion. This is defined by hyponatremia and hypoosmolality resulting from inappropriate ADH secretion despite normal or increased plasma volume which results in impaired water excretion. Essentially ADH causes solid free water to be absorbed back into the serum. Since this is solid free this causes hypoosmolality and hyponatremia. Volume status is not grossly affected though the patient can edge towards hypervolemia depending upon the degree of ADH released. Signs and symptoms of ADH are hyponatremia as previously discussed. Causes of ADH include brain damage such as meningitis, sub subarachnoid hemorrhage, malignancy, notable, notably small cell lung cancer, lymphoma, cancer of the duodenum and pancre pancreatitis can also lead to this. Other causes include uh, infection and drugs such as carbamazepine, uh, selective serotonin receptor inhibitors, amitriptyline, morphine, hypothyroidism uh, can also cause this condition, as can acute intermittent porphyria. porphyria sorry. Given that SIADH can have sinister underlying causes, it is imperative to investigate this fully. We can send up urea and electrolytes, which would show a decreased sodium level. This, in combination with a raised potassium and acidotic patient in a type 4 renal, renal tubular acidosis, would, would point towards Addison's disease. Serum osmolality is reduced due to sodium being a large constituent in the serum. Urine osmolality is increased in SIADH as solid free water is reabsorbed. Urinary sodium would be relatively raised as solid free water is reabsorbed. Private function tests can help to rule out hyperthyroidism and short synactin tests can be used to exclude Addison's. Chest x-ray and CT head MRI brain radiographs are useful in excluding other causes of SIADH such as craniopharyngioma and other pituitary pathology. 
The following criteria has to be met in order to make a diagnosis of SIADH plasma at sodium concentration less than 135, plasma osmolality less than 280, urine osmolality greater than 100, and urinary, syndrome, urinary sodium concentration greater than 30. Patients should be clinically uvolemic and there should be absence of adrenal and thyroid dysfunction and no diuretic use. Management of SIADH is to fluid restrict the patient and to investigate the underlying cause. This is important. So here are the references used in this presentation. Okay guys, that's the end of the presentation. Thanks again for watching. If you do have any questions or queries, please do let us know. Any improvements and suggestions are also welcome. Thanks again for watching.